Hello, everybody. Welcome to iCube, episode 30. Yes, I am halfway through my third year of iCube, my labor of love. So, for those of you who are new,、uh, iCube came out of my desire to give back to medicine, I guess, to really share what I've learned in 27 years of doing clinical emergency medicine. I wanted to combine visual learning with audio learning. That's why the slideshow connected with the podcast. And hopefully, the retention of the inf- information and material I present will be higher because you've now watched and listened at the same time. Well, I want to welcome back my repeat guest, Dr. Christian Patterson. He's back for the third time. He is an alumnus from my、um, wonderful residency, Maricopa Medical Center. He is born and raised Arizona, in Arizona, Saint, Saint John, small town. <laughs> There you go. Yes, that's right. And you went to ASU. And where did you go to medical school? Medical school at Mid- Midwestern in Glendale. Pretty much all Arizona. I've got, <laughs> I've got pretty deep roots in Arizona. Yes, it's wonderful. And it's great to have Christian on. All right. So let's、uh, just go ahead and dive right in. So, patient number one, he is a 59 year old gentleman who comes in and he has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chronic back. So he comes into the ER and he comes in by ambulance. He says he's got a lot of upper. And central chest pain. It started abruptly an hour before coming in. Okay. He says it's really kind of heavy. It woke him from sleep and it radiates the, directly to the back in the same position in the back. He said he feels short of breath. His wife chimes in and she says, Well, you know, we just came back from California three weeks ago. So then he also says that he'd been seeing a doctor for some kind of aneurysm in his legs. He said he felt fine when he went to bed and this morning、uh, he was awakened by this really. Severe pain. He's never had a pain like this before. So we look at his past history. He's had、uh, GERD. He's got the chronic back, asthma, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. Okay? Could be, could be anything thus far. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. So, anyway, his vital is very important.、Uh, systolic blood pressure of 90 over 51. His pulse is 59. Sats are 99% on 2 liters. And his temp orally is 36.7. He looks sick. He looks like he doesn't feel well. He's taking these sort of long, uncomfortable, gasping breaths. And、uh, otherwise, though, he has pretty normal examination and、uh, cooperative. And,、uh, you know, he's a little bit bradycardic on the heart exam, but there's no murmurs, there's no rubs, there's no, no gallops, there's no wheezing. And so immediately, you know, we get EKGs right away on these folks that come in with chest pain. What do you think? All right, yes, we do look at a million of these. Is, I just <laughs> got off shift, so this is my million and one today. <laughs> so it looks like sinus. I mean,、yeah. he's got P、uh-huh. waves before everything, narrow QRS complexes everywhere. I don't see a lot of real ST, nothing obvious jumping、mm-hmm. out as ST、uh, mm-hmm. segment elevations or depressions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nothing that I would,、uh, I would call,、right. especially for a patient that looks this sick. Right, right. I mean, the vitals are notable because he's a little、mm-hmm. brady and he's a mildly hypotensive. For a guy who's 59、mm-hmm. with his or hypertension, it piques my interest for sure. Okay. So then you can do, we do bedside x rays, you know, on these sick people. So this is his chest film. And looking at this, I, it looks like、for? I can see pulmonary markings everywhere,、okay. looking for possible、uh, brains not functioning once again, pneumothorax. <laughs> right.、Um, right. I don't see any like, obvious pneumonia. Right. His right. heart size is normal, so it doesn't look like you know, a CHF.、Right. He doesn't really look volume overloaded、right. like a CHF exacerbation either. Right. Also, not that exciting. Nope, you're right. Now what? I'm still, again, with this guy describing、yeah. it as going to his back, I'm still、yeah. a little bit worried about possible, possible dissection. Sure. Yeah, yeah.、Um, recent trip, it sounds like、That's、it was、right. a couple weeks before. Just three weeks before he went and back from California, driving, a driving trip. Got to think, you know, possible DVT PE、sure. situation. So he's got a pretty wide differential. Yeah. What would you order at this point? Because we've got the, all the bedside studies we needed. You know, we get those very quickly here.、Mm-hmm. So, we have a brand new, beautiful ultrasound machine. Thank、yeah. you to Dr. Zofsky. So, I would consider doing that. I actually did、yes. that on one of my hypot-、yes. hypotensive patients today, just、uh. doing a quick exam, looking at cardiac squeeze, IVC. You can、That's、look at、great. the lungs real quick. Just, you can get a quick picture of what's going on. That's right.、Um, but, you know, so I would possibly grab the ultrasound and、yeah. look. At the same time, I'd be ordering, you know, CBC,、mm-hmm. um, CMP.、Mm-hmm. 
I don't know if I do a D dimer on this patient or just jump straight to the CT yeah, angio because I wanted. Right. I think I'd probably just jump straight to the CT angio. Um, the problem is, is radiology is probably going to call me and ask me, "Are you looking for a dissection? Are you looking for pulmonary embolism?" Because they're actually different timing studies. Exactly. And the problem is I'm kind of looking for both. <laughs> yep, you're right. That's always been a um, conundrum because we are often in our differentials, often pairing the two, PE and rule out PE and rule out the dissection. So uh, that, I mean, that one, if they called and asked me that question, I... <laughs> Flip a, flip a coin and yeah, pick your exactly. favorite. Yeah, exactly. Pick your one exactly. Exactly. Um, and I'd probably, I mean, if he's if he does if he's got clear breast sounds throughout, I'd probably hit him with some fluids to kind of help with that hypotension. Right. Um, and then I'm thinking if I would give him any other med- any other medications. He's in pain. He's in a lot of pain, actually. If he's in a lot of pain, I'd probably reach for something like fentanyl, right. maybe not morphine because we don't want to worsen his hypotension. Exactly. Exactly. But maybe do a little bit of fentanyl to help control his pain and. Yeah, so and then just see, uh, yeah, just for now, and we'll just see how it goes, right? All right, well, we're going to put that patient on the side because I have another patient. Patient number two. Now, another 50-ish-year-old gentleman comes in the ER. Now, this guy looks even worse. He looks bad. He's 53 years old. He's a tall, thin, pale guy. He has a history of CHF. He, he comes in with a lot of chest pain. Um, but he ha- says he has a history of a stent in his left groin, okay? He couldn't give me any other details, but he says that he had a history of a PE back in 2009, but he took himself off the blood thinner about a year and a half ago. Um, he said the pain came on at 7.30 th- that morning, so this is about 10 o'clock in the morning when I see him. It came on abruptly at 7.30. He said that he also had a lot of abdominal pain and right groin pain. His back was hurting. He felt really dizzy and diaphoretic all of a sudden. So I get this little minimal history, actually, as I'm standing next to him, talking to him, but he's looking really sick. He's profusely clammy and diaphoretic, but he's lucid. Uh, his heart exam is unremarkable. His normal, t- normal rate rhythm and there's no murmurs. His belly is very soft, but it is diffusely tender. But um, his right foot is ice cold. There is no pulse. And I reach for the left foot immediately. And he's got a nice pulse in the left foot. I go up to the groin, and he's very tender in the right groin. I don't feel a femoral pulse. I am immediately thinking, okay, there is something going on that is going to stretch from the chest down to his leg. What do I think it was that? Dissection, of course. <laughs> You're thinking dissection, the same thing that I'm thinking. Right, right. So the first thing I think of is, okay, this guy, he's got a dissection, right? I look at his blood pressure. It is sky high. It's 206 over 113. I actually, at first, I was worried he was hypotensive because he was so pale and diaphoretic, right? But he's very hypertensive. 206 over 113. His pulse is actually okay, 87. He's afebrile. His stats are fine. So get him settled, get an EKG. What do you think? Um, this one, I see P waves mm-hmm. everywhere. I mean, it looks like this is still sinus. Um, that he does have some ST elevation in V2. Yeah. But it looks more mm-hmm. like repole. It does look yeah. more like yeah. repole. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of reciprocal changes anywhere. Correct. So I probably wouldn't, you know, activate cardiac, yeah. you know, cath lab off this or anything. I didn't. Not totally normal, but. It's not a STEMI, I didn't think. I think it was repole. Chest x-ray, bedside, what do you think? His heart does look a little bit big. Yeah. And then if you look at that aortic knob, that looks very, very <laughs> large, very, very concerning. Right. That I mean, knob is really prominent when you look at it, right? So what now? <laughs> so that leg ain't normal. His leg's white. I mean, it's not normal. Yeah, yeah. I'm still probably going to get imaging of this. So I'd probably do a CT angio you know, of the aorta, especially with that aortic knob looking enlarged, chest, yeah. abdomen, pelvis. Absolutely. And I would also have, I would call and have them include lower extremity runoffs. Um, so that way you can get imaging kind of all the way down. Exactly. But with, and with that blood picture. pressure being as high as it is, I would probably almost start treatment before waiting for the results. So I'd probably start him on, I would reach for probably Esmolol first and do an Esmolol drip because you can titrate it. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then titrate his blood pressure down. Right. Also, his heart rate down. It'll slow his heart rate down as right. well. Right. Again, the guy's diaphoretic. Doesn't look great. So I keep a close eye on him if I'm starting the Esmolol just to make sure he doesn't totally crash. Right. But I would right. probably start that hanging on our way as we're yeah. walking to the CT scanner, <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, so those are my two cases. Let's look at their uh, hospital course. Okay, so the first one is that 59-year-old gentleman who just traveled back from California. He's abruptly woken up with this uh, uh, anterior chest pain that radiates directly to the back. I was able to get some of his labs back. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And troponin was negative. I had ordered a CTA to rule out PE. So the radiologist calls me and he goes, Dissection. he goes, he goes, uh, there's a the thoracic dissection, but this is not a good study. You need a dedicated thoracic aorta to scan. So I went ahead and ordered that. You're never going to pick right on those. <laughs> so if you watch the. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. The arch. And now this is the. Coming all the way down. This is the descending aorta. You see that? Along the spine, all the way down. <laughs> it goes from the aortic root all the way to the iliacs. Oh, wow. Look at that. It just goes all the way down to the iliacs. And finally, I think we're done. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so that was crazy. Obviously, the guy gets admitted to CT surgery to get his surgery done, and he actually did very well. He was discharged six days later that he did very, very well. The next patient, because I was so worried about him, patient number two, the 53-year-old, right, who's got chest pain, belly pain, back pain, and a pulseless right foot. I will go over to the CT scanner with him, and I see the scan in front of me. So this is his aortic knob. Large. Oh, that the dissection. <laughs> there it is. See that? It mm -hmm. just goes... So this is a gentleman, right, who has the right foot, pulseless right foot, and this report also, this section started in the descending aorta and goes all the way, all the way down to the right. And you'll see that there's actually like a, a little bit of a hematoma at the, right here, a hematoma around the right groin. You see that? Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of stops right there all right so then the first ct scan reading was a stanford type a aortic dissection of the thoracic and abdominal aortas this is the dissection begins at the aortic root and then um the dissection extends into both common iliac arteries and the right external iliac the second ct is an aortic dissection type 3 from the proximal descending thoracic aorta through the abdominal aorta into the right iliac system the only visible hematoma is unusual and surrounding the right common femoral artery, like we saw. So, as you know, we've got learning focus number one and number two for my screencast. So the first one is obviously acute aortic dissection. So recently, um, I listened to a really great podcast by none other than Amomatu, okay? It is the September um, September edition of EMCASP. We'll start off with the classification. The simplest one is the Stanford, which I really like. It's easy because it only has two categories, type A, which involves the ascending aorta and the arch, and type B is uh, all the other ones, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. type A... We do stuff on now. Type B, sometimes we can watch and wait. Right. Essentially, you're right. Type A is surgical and type B is non-surgical, but we'll talk details about that. The Bakey is an older classification, and the Bakey has a type 1, which involves the ascending um, aorta and not and at least including the arch. Type 2 only has the ascending aorta, so it's is a shorter segment. Type 3 is what my patient had, which had uh, only the descending aorta. The incidence of a thoracic aortic dissection is 2.6 to 3.5 per 100,000 person years. Um, very, very rare, actually, very rare. Have you heard of the IRAD? No, I have no, not. No, you have not. I'm about to. Yes, you are about to hear all about the IRAD. So IRAD stands for International Registry of Acute Aortic Dissection. It was established in 1996. There's actually 51 active sites in 12 countries in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. And the database is a huge database. It contains 7,300 cases of acute aortic dissection. 
This is actually a really giant database, which is great. And uh, the most recent article was published just in circulation in April uh, of 2018. There's been 80 articles published out of the information from the IRI, which is great. So according to the article, uh, two-thirds are type A, one-third type B, and overall the mean age of the patients were 63 years old. Um, 86% were Caucasian, but you have to remember these sites were all like European, U.S., and Australian. There's one country in Asia, Japan. <laughs> oh, okay. I looked at the map. <laughs> so um, there might be a reason that 86% yeah, are all Caucasian. Caucasian. Yeah, yeah it, doesn't, it does not include Africa at all. Um, so then it talks about the risk factors the most common in the patients was, as we've been taught, you know, hypertension. 76.6% of the patients had uh, hypertension. The next most common risk factor is atherosclerosis, which is only in 27%, which is a little surprising to me, honestly. And then 16% of the patients had a known aortic aneurysm. Um, 16 of the patients had a previous cardiac surgery of some sort. 5% of these patients had Marfan's. Uh, 4% of these uh, dissection patients had iatrogenic causes. And then cocaine use was associated in 1.8% of these patients. That's a lot of patients out of 7,300 7, uh, cases that were cocaine abusers. Um, so then they make a, the, the IBI makes a sort of a special point about the uh, acute aortic dissections in patients that are younger. So they were considered younger if they were less than 40 years of age. Um, these patients had less history of hypertension, so only 34% versus 76%, right? And they had actually even less atherosclerosis, also 1% only in these patients, less than 6, 40. And that makes sense. You know, they, mm-hmm. they are very young. Um, Haven't had enough time to develop all the right, black. Right, exactly. <laughs> so then um, a remarkably large number of these patients, 59% of these young patients, had either Marfan's or bicuspid. So really, really significant. So when you hear of Marfan's or bicuspid valves, you really have to perk up. Um, black patients in comparison with the white patients in the, in the cohort, um, there was a higher prevalence of type Bs for some reason in the black patients, uh, 52%. And there was more frequent history of hypertension in the black population, 89.7%, and more diabetics, um, 13.2%, and more cocaine abuse um, in that population of 13.2%. Um, believe it or not, there is actually a biochronologic uh, pattern. The, the frequency of aortic dissections was higher between 6 and 12 in the morning. And the peak time was actually 8 to 9 o'clock. And it was higher in the winter. There was more incidence of dissection in the winter. Beware morning shift. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So we'll just kind of run through this. Uh, these things we taught uh, all through residency and medical school, right? Signs and symptoms. And some of this is very clear te- textbook and some of it is really not textbook. Some of it is a little bit uh, surprising. So the most common symptom is chest or back pain, right? And then in the type A's, it's more common of the type A's to have chest pain versus type B's, they're actually more common to have back pain. Then isolated abdominal pain in a thoracic dissection was seen in 4.6%. That is a little scary. So the, I, the people who come in with abdominal pain, no chest pain, we're supposed to think about thoracic dissection. <laughs> um, painless dissection, 6.3%. Um, and interestingly, the classic textbook description of a tearing or ripping, migratory chest pain or back pain is really not common in these uh, patients in the IRAD. Hypertension at presentation is actually more common in a type B dissection in 70% of them and then in, than in the type A, which is 36%, which actually is reflected in my two patients, yeah. right? Then diastolic aortic insufficient or regurg murmur was seen in 40% of the type A dissections and hypotension in greater than 25% of the type B, and that's also reflected mm-hmm. in my patient. Pulse deficits were seen in 30% of type A's and 20% in type B's. You definitely had a pulse deficit in your patient, might, although I'll, it was lower at extremity, right, but right. you definitely had a pulse deficit. Right, that was type B, and it was 20% in type B's and 30% in type, type A's. So diagnosis, so, <laughs> so obviously it's really, really imperative to decide which type of uh, dissection it is, which category, right? So if it's a type A, as we talked about earlier, type A is surgical. Type B is non-surgical, medical. 
um, there is a 1% to 2% increase in mortality every single hour that you delay in the diagnosis from the time of onset. So I'm proud to say both of my patients were diagnosed within that first 90 minutes. Uh, the medium medium time to diagnosis from arrival is 4.3 hours, which I beat. Yay. Beat it. <laughs> mean interval from, from diagnosis to surgery is also 4.3 hours. That's very interesting. Um, EKG, well, not really helpful. The most common finding is a nonspecific ST changes, which is uh, awful. But um, so... In the resident, in, in residency, and we always taught to look for the wide mediastinum, but actually wide mediastinum or aortic, enlarged aortic knob is actually, um, less than 80%. Wow. So there's 20% that really don't even have either one of those. So we can't rely on that being a rule out tool, right? Um, in the IRAD cohort, the initial study was a CTA in 69% of the patients. An echocardiogram in 25%, and an MRI in 4%, and aortography in 3%. Um, the authors wrote in this circulation article that the use of TEE as the initial diagnostic imaging study has waned over time. Now, in the podcast with Alma Matu, uh, George Willis was one of the guests, and he said that for him, he considers the TEE for the unstable patient. And that makes total sense because it's mm-hmm. a bedside study. All right. So then we'll talk about biomarkers a little bit later, but management and mortality on the, on the aortic section. So type A dissections, Stanford type A dissections nowadays have uh, more than 90% of them have surgical intervention with uh, 86% overall in uh, uh, the IRAD cohort. The in-hospital mortality has decreased from 31% to 22% due to the decline in the surgical mortality. So that over the years uh, that the IRAD has been in you know, existence, the surgical technique or whatever has gotten better. And so their mortality is less and less. The medical mortality is still high. Uh, type B, Stanford type B at this section, overall in hospital mortality is pretty low, 13%. The medical management of type B dissection went from 75% to 57% more recently as endovascular management has increased from 7% to 31% of the cases. So then the authors said now endovascular treatment exceeds conventional open surgery as the preferred treatment modality for most of these cases. In fact, my type B a dissection patient got uh, a vascular consult rather than a surgical consult. Um, so then this is a little surprising. For type B dissections, aortic arch involvement was actually present in 16% of them. <laughs> so um, I suppose... Wait a minute. Yeah. I thought type B was supposed to be... I mean, I guess descending. technically it can be the den- descending port of the portion of the aortic Right, arch. so it's a retrograde dissection up okay. to the arch and, and as well as going uh, forward dissection down. Yeah. There are special subgroups uh, that this article talks about. Women were uh, on average were a little older, uh, 67 years of age. The women with type A dissections had, had a higher surgical mortality, which is kind of odd. The authors didn't have an explanation for that. It was 32% versus 22% in men. Uh, Marfan syndrome were um, less than 5%, but they had higher recurrence rate. So um, in the September 2018 EM cast with I'm Open 2, one of his two guests was Dr. Brian Parker from University of Texas, San Antonio. He he sums it up really, really nicely. He sums up the treatment very nicely. He says he has three rules. Number one, control the pain and the heart rate. Because uh, if you control the pain, the heart rate will usually improve. So he said fentanyl drip for him and starting Esmolol, which you also said to do. Uh, start Esmolol to control the heart rate. Or if you need to, or if you don't have Esmolol, you can use diltiazem to help bring the heart rate down to about 60 and then number two, his number two rule was to control the blood pressure with either nicardipine or nitroprusside. Have you heard of clavidipine? I don't think so. Yeah. I, I know I've never ordered it. We don't have it here. I okay. called, but I had learned about it on this podcast. It is a short-acting nicardipine. Yeah, whereas like cardipine takes hours to kind of uh, dissipate. Clavidipine, you can shut off and it'll be gone in a few minutes. 
That would be handy. Yeah, it would be very handy. So if you, for some reason, overshot the blood pressure or whatnot, you can shut it off. So the ideal you're aiming for a systolic blood pressure of 120 and a MAP between 60 and 75. And then number three rule for dissection management is if you suspect this is a dissection or you've got proof that it is dissection, just get them started on the treatment and then call your surgeon, right? Complications of this this section was a a few and mostly having to do the intimal flap. So, you know, uh, as you see in the diagram, the the intima is where the dissection goes through and that flap can freely um, float or it can, as it tears away from the wall, it can occlude um, the branch vessels. So uh, Dr. George Willis does a really nice talk uh, on this, and he talks about uh, most of the um, malperfusion syndromes come from these occluded uh, branch arteries, and they're usually in the type B ones. So the SMA gets occluded, that's most common. The renal artery gets occluded, and if that does, uh, you may see persistent hypertension despite your IV uh, meds, right? And then there's limb ischemia, like in my guy, my my guy with uh, type B. Type A dissections also have their uh, associated complications. They have, again, it has to do with the uh, flap, the intimal flap. It can occlude your osteo, the coronary arteries. You get the STEMI for that, right? You can also occlude your carotids. Then there's sort of the dreaded pericardial tamponade, um, which... Um, he talks about something called a CPD, which is a controlled pericardial drainage, taking not taking the whole kit and caboodle out of the pericardial sac, but like 15 cc's at a time, just so you can get blood pressure up a little bit. Um, and then there's aortic regurgitation insufficiency, which is hinted at if you have a persistent tachycardia despite your esmolol or, um, yeah, your esmolol drip to try to uh, beta block them down. And then this is a... Uh, Frank rupture. I mean, the last one, this is uh, unsalvageable. Frank I rupture. was about to say, there's not much you can do with that. Um, <laughs> right, right. So, unsalvageable. Yeah, I, a couple of things that I remember from residency yeah. is they said, you know, anytime somebody's got chest pain uh-huh. and neuro symptoms, you got to consider right. dissection because once again, it can go up to your, up to the, you know, up to the carotids. So totally true. Learning focus number two, we'll go through this quickly. Have you heard of this, which is the aortic dissection detection risk score? I don't believe I've heard of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to. You're going to learn. So um, I had never heard of this, but uh, once again, George, Dr. George Willis in that uh, podcast with Amo Matu talked about this. Um, he says that combining this score, ADDRS score, with D-dimer it's actually a pretty good tool to rule out a dissection without imaging a patient, believe it or not. So let's talk about this. He said that there was a um, score called the uh, Aortic Dissection Detection Risk Score that was put on by the American Heart Association, actually, back in 2012. And um, the ADD score is based on three high-risk features of the patient. So number one has to do with high risk conditions. So the patient, if they have Marfan, if they have a family history of aortic disease, if they have known aortic valve disease, such as a bicuspid valve, if they have known thoracic aneurysm, and or they have a previous aortic manipulation, including cardiac surgery, that would be a, a score of one if they have any of these high risk conditions. High risk symptoms is a number, the second feature to consider. So if the patient comes in with Severe, abrupt, ripping, chest, back, or abdominal pain. That would be a score of one. As I mean, that would be a one point, okay? And the third high-risk feature would be physical exam finding. So if they have a perfusion deficit, like my guy, if their blood pressure uh, is significantly different, different between their limbs, if they have a focal neurologic deficit, if they have an aortic diastolic murmur, presumably new, or if they're hypotensive or shocky. So there's no mention of hypertension in these high risk factors. But anyway, so high risk physical exam findings would, any of those would give you one point. So the total of three points maximum for the ADD, one point for each of these high risk features. Um, there was a trial called advised trial that was published in circulation January of 2018 that looked at the utility of the ADD score plus a D-dimer in those who have suspected aortic syndrome. 
the study was actually a pretty good sized study, it looks like, 1,850 patients. So in this study, so basically what they concluded was that if you have an ADD score of zero or one plus a negative D-dimer, mm -hmm. zero or one plus a negative D-dimer, you would have a failure rate of only 0.03%. So that's one in 300. That's pretty good. That, that's I'm, pretty good. That is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so aortic syndrome is, by definition, aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, frank rupture, or an aortic ulcer. So if you have an ADD score of 2 or 3, not 0 or 1, you need to do the imaging. Um, at the end of this article in circulation in 2018, uh, the advised trial, unfortunately, they don't really give you the conclusion you need, but <laughs> the authors are not actually recommending routine use of this ADD score plus the dimer as a diagnostic tool yet and recommends uh, validation in future studies. But it's a very interesting concept, an interesting tool that we can probably include in our clinical decision making, although not using it exclusively. You know? And good news, I just looked, yeah. it is actually on uh, MD Calc. Oh. So it's on there already. So, so there's some legitimacy to that. <laughs> sure. But there is a big warning on there that says the same thing. It, oh, you know, it is see. not it's, it should be used with caution because oh, it's I not see, 100% validated right. yet. All right. So Chris, thank you so much once again for joining me for um, being part of Thanks my, for having uh, me. Yeah. I learned a lot on this one. You did. Excellent. Excellent. Anyway, so thank you everybody for watching this month. Hope you're having a nice summer, relaxing uh, and enjoyable summer. We'll see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.